in data science. Tennessee. All right, good, every, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up to what might be a thinking session at the end of a, a long conference. I uh, completely understand if you want to sit back and let it, let it wash over you, you can choose your own level of engagement. Um, that said, uh, there is hands-on material available for those who, who want to follow along and work through code on their own systems. Can I get a, a vague show of hands for who has already set up the environment? Great. Can I get another show of hands for who's interested in setting up the environment who hasn't? Okay, quite a few people. All right. So this is what tutorials tend to be like for me, which is just you know a whole lot of falling over and stubbing of toes and failing. And almost all of that is due to trying to set up the environment. So I'm going to structure this talk as 20 minutes of barely controlled chaos while we attempt to get everybody up and running followed by let not the fast wait for the slow. Uh, in which case, I don't mean that the content will be moving too fast, but I'm just going to walk through the content thereafter. And for those who've managed to get set up in that time frame, great, they'll be able to follow along. For everyone else, you'll be able to see everything up on the screen any, uh, e easily anyway. So this is probably going to be really boring for the, those uh, watching the later recording. So commence 20 minutes of boring content. Okay, so for those of you who are in front of your machines, if you, here is the, the very simple uh, instructions. You will need to install something called either Anaconda or Miniconda will be the Python environment uh, that, that you know, works with this script. You can use pip, but there are various problems uh, trying to do everything straightforwardly from pip. Um, so that's why if the script doesn't work for you, there's a tiny URL to how I did it step by step. And if the tiny URL has expired, there's a long form URL that you can type in from there. Uh, and essentially, inside the, this code repository exists this script. So in theory, clone this script, you have Anaconda, you run this command, and like two minutes later, you're done. So that's the theory. Um, so I'm going to get off the stage and help people install their environments. So hands up who hasn't got Anaconda or doesn't know what I'm talking about with Anaconda. Brilliant, up the back. All right, anyone else who knows about Anaconda or has got the environment set up who feels like doing a bit of a room walk around, find someone and help them get going. And, and then we can all kind of manage to get through this, this first period together. And I'm going to go help this guy with Anaconda. So we've got a question from the back. Is it Python 3? Yes, it's Python 3. And yes, that script creates its own virtual env. Um, in Anaconda, they're just called environments, but it is the same conceptually. Um, for anyone who's downloading Anaconda from scratch, there's an alternative called Miniconda, which is like a 30 meg install instead of like a 300 meg install. So it'll just go faster. I'm not actually sure what the content difference between the two is because I've already got Anaconda and I didn't 
go to that level of trouble to optimize the, the install, but Miniconda should do exactly the same thing, but it comes with less guff to start with. Yeah, it has the data as well. It's not it's not huge amounts of data, but it's I guess it's enough. Yeah, that's right. If anyone has a USB key and is getting frustrated at trying to clone the repository, I'm happy to put a copy on. I I uh, I have ten USB keys sitting on my desk at work, um, which helps none of us. All right, we're doing a bit of uh, iterative slide improvement here. So we've uh, discovered a uh, common, common mistake. So what you need to do is run bash at the beginning of it. Yeah. So, so that script doesn't have like a hash bang to specify the Python interpreter. So you might need to you might not be able to just like run it as such. You might need to specify bash at the start to get it to execute. Nine more minutes.
No, it was not on. Um, if you can get this fixed in two days, I'll tell everyone in the room how amazing your, your free support community is. They had fixed it in two days. I haven't actually verified that this is functional and not needed, but they tell me that this is done, and that's pretty amazing support for a company when I'm just leaving some random support message on their board. And I didn't actually try to twist their arm with uh, the presentation content until way later in the process. So they would do this anyway because they're good people. So uh, in theory, you do not need to do this at any stage if you're on OSX. But if you have problems, you go ahead and do that uh, right at the end. Yeah, you won't know whether that's necessary or not until later inside one of the notebooks. This thing just doesn't work when you try to import it. Um, so that's how you'll, so you'll only know later in the tutorial whether that's worked or not. Um, but in theory, you can now leave that out. All right, everyone in the room who's on OSX, we have an OSX user here who's trying to install Word to Vec and they can't find malloc.h, and neither of us understand what the Google results mean for that. If anyone knows what that is, over here.
Yeah, thanks for every, everyone's patience during this, but it, it helps us all to get onto a sort of similar playing field to start with, and yeah, it's worth doing. It says less than a minute, and I'm going to kick off again at 1.30. Yep. Yep. Pretty weird. No, that's not normal. Yeah, that that part's normal. Yeah, hit space bar, it'll get through it quicker. Yeah, that's okay. So hit space bar, and that'll take it towards the end. And then just type yes. And then just hit enter, that's a perfectly reasonable place. Can right. I change it later? Sorry, could you just do the mic off? Sorry? Oh, could you just do the mic off? Sorry. Yep. All right, uh, so thanks for everyone's patience while we got at least a few more people uh, set up. Sorry to those people uh, still setting up. Um, hopefully you managed to feel free to you know, type along and, and try and get it going while we uh, get through the presentation. For the benefit of the AV people, we are now coming back uh, to the presentation. Um, so yep, unfortunately, if it's still broken, you'll have to fix it yourself. Okay, so what are some things we think about when we hear about data science? This one uh, coming off this morning's uh, keynote might, might have some similar tones. The, uh, the AI apocalypse is something that uh, you know, gets talked about. You know, reasonably serious people genuinely talk about artificial intelligence as, as an existential threat. Then again, many people who are actually working in the area don't see the same, same level of existential threat at all. So a Andrew Ng, mm, mm, I don't actually know how to effectively pronounce the surname mm, I apologise to the, the uh, mauling of, of pronunciation that I've just been through. Um, but he's probably one of the leading, probably he is definitely one of the leading AI and machine learning re researchers of our time. Um, and as far as he's concerned, it's not really an issue that's on the radar right now. I've talked to a lot of people about what's data science, that, like a lot of it's spreadsheets. There's a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of companies with a lot of information. I don't like working with spreadsheets very much. I suspect that even those people don't like working with spreadsheets very much, but when you're running a business, information is very, very important. So a lot of effort is put into pulling the information out of spreadsheets and making effective uh, uh, learning exercises from those. But what should we care? What, what is your average software engineer? Well, I, 
I'm not that I'm trying to accuse anyone here of being an average software engineer, but what is a commonly a, a common case software engineer? Uh, what, why is this now something that would be potentially of interest to them rather than being the domain of a researcher or a specialist? And this, this is my sort of basic contention, is that now this is moving into a space of a, a commonly used technology that many people should understand how to how to work with, many people would be able to deploy in, in the ordinary course of their day work with a, with, a little bit of, with a little bit of learning and coaching. So the reason is, for me, that there's, a, a, there's an emerging convergence of paradigms, which is to say common data representations for approach and paradigms and patterns for approaching machine learning problems uh, in a way that I feel was not so easily handleable in the past. So it is now much more straightforward to find common techniques in a broad variety of computing languages and environments that are applied in a consistent fashion to the kinds of information that we typically have to deal with. Um, and that th those patterns and paradigms are using vector and matrix representations uh, of things like network layers. So mo rather than using uh, a complicated object model which might pose some computational challenges, people have worked out how to distill this stuff down into, into arrays and relatively simple like linear layered uh, approaches to building up their networks and building their approaches to machine learning problems. There's convergence between the way that information is represented for images, the kinds of numbers that you find in spreadsheets, text and statistics. So the, there's also a convergence of the way that we, that we represent information. So whereas in the past you might have had a broad divergence between someone who is doing text generation and natu natural language generation versus someone who is trying to predict sales demand on the basis of t-shirt sales last month in terms of the way that they were storing and handling their information. That's becoming much closer together. Um, Physical modeling, I include to exclude. I'm not really particularly focused on, on people who are involved in uh, like weather modeling or, or trying to explicitly, causally, uh, in a deterministic sense, model some, some process. Um, and the, but the, also, the algorithms is also a, a piece of convergence. So um, now, many, many problems, people will just kind of throw these algorithms at, and many, many times they'll work. Some of them require very little customization and expertise to apply effectively, um, and some of them require a, a little bit more work, yes, but, not, but not, not any more than you would say cover in a semester of university or a three week intensive run at it at work or by watching you know, a few hours of YouTube videos. You could certainly say follow the best practices and get some effective results or go a little bit further and do some personal investigations and understand how to tune these things, which means that they're now pretty much, they're pretty much in reach. They're not super easy to understand, but they're, they're well within in what uh, any professional programmer is going to have to contend with now and again. It's certainly much easier than understanding why businesses are run the way they are or where deadlines come from, for example. There are some limitations and bumps. Um, the, the, the growth and effect of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning techniques has turned people increasingly into data space work. So in, whereas before you might have gone, oh, I'm, I'm just like so clever, I've come up with these amazing rules that work really well for my examples. Well now there are too many machine learning algorithms that just work and we just have to sit there and filter data manually. and and work with people's spreadsheets and convert them and handle, handle the fact that uh, addresses are represented four different ways and we have to, have to sniff out and magically know how to, how to destructure this information. So the data munging side of things is still sadly unsolved and, and we're very successfully putting ourselves in, in the worst area of work for these problems. So I'm a little sad about that. Um, Physical modeling and identifying causation is a challenge. All of these techniques are statistical techniques. You can use them, if used carefully, for example, in a time series, you may be able to infer that some kind of causal link is very likely, but it's not the same thing as coming up with a, a clear specific rule-based hypothesis and being able to test it. It's more, it's a bit fuzzier than that. So you, you might feel there's some uncertainties about whether you can really trust these things or whether you can really explain to your boss or the public or yourself whether you should actually be reliant on some of these algorithms. Um, hypothesis testing can be a challenge, uh, as I said. Induction and deduction beyond correlation. Um, so actually coming up with, there's this statistical link, 
oh, I now have a new kind of working hypothesis and, and to, to extend the model beyond that is challenging. So correctly identifying the past and the future, if you don't already have an idea that you need to link those things, these aren't necessarily going to solve that for you. So choosing features and feature selection is very important and they won't necessarily choose that for you. Things inexplicably just don't work with no explanation quite a lot of the time. So your model that worked yesterday and today and the day before that on a slightly novel problem will simply fail to produce useful results and there's really not a good theoretical or practical explanation for why that is and you just have to try a whole bunch of alternatives and eventually one of them works and you don't really know why that one was chosen you know, ex you know, separately from some of the ones that didn't work but it did and you've got a result and you move on with your life. But that, I find that's like an unsatisfying reality. Uh, also, adversarial examples, which I spent some time on at the end of the presentation, are super, super interesting. Uh, and the, the basic concept of an adversarial example is if you have a photograph of a pen, it's relatively, and you can recognize that using an image classifier. So at, at least for many networks, it's relatively easy to identify a visually indistinguishable similar photo of that pen, which will not be successfully recognized. So we, we find that there are ways to put the lie to the performance uh, of some of these algorithms as well, um, which is quite interesting. So what's the grab bag? What are we going to be including today? So here's a bunch of, bunch of current, current cutting edge buzzwords. All of the, all of the Twitter feeds are, are burning, burning with the use of these, these buzzwords. Um, they're good buzzwords. They're good technologies. I'm not a research level. I don't have research level knowledge in any of these. I've conducted some personal experiments with the guide to discovering how effectively I can make use of them rather than actually trying to be critical of the techniques themselves. Uh, but by the end of the day, you will have addressed most of these. Uh, it, the, the basic use of them is relatively straightforward um, and, the, and they're, they're computationally quite tractable on, on most, most platforms these days. Um, so I might, might present a little bit of my background just because I think it's relevant to a tutorial to understand where the speaker's coming from. So I work as a software engineer. I have a deep and abiding interest in these concepts, but I am terrible at maths. I'm just truly awful. And, and getting this knowledge to stay in my head is an ongoing battle. So I have to repeat myself. I have to read things in a great deal of detail and then forget them and then do it again. And there will be people in the audience who know many aspects of this much better than I do. Um, my conclusion from that is I nonetheless have something to add because what I've done is, is bring it all together in a consumable format. Um, but also, I think we should approach this as just like a room full of people with some knowledge. And if, so, if, I'm, if I come up short somewhere, I'm going to throw to the room and ask people about their experience as well and sort of try and keep everyone awake a bit. So we're going to try and cover all of this in the remaining 70, now much less than 70 minutes, hopefully with some time to spare, possibly not anymore. Um, and if time allows, we can try and solve something novel and we can conduct a room-based experiment to whether these techniques are truly as easy to apply as what I've said. Uh, so the remaining sessions are broken up into two practical orienta oriented sessions, um, followed by some final slides, sort of discussion of some interesting results. Um, so yeah, a, a few, few more slides on what this isn't going to be. This is not going to be a maths hipster tutorial. There are many of those, those on the internet. Uh, I've read many of them and, and run away. Uh, this will not be the magician tutorial. You just install the package and then feed it canned data and then you get the expected result. And you just customize it for whatever you need. In fact, I have supplied many pre-worked examples, but we're going to go through many aspects of the configuration of them and look at them in some depth. Uh, this is intended not to be an incomplete tutorial. Uh, there are many of those on the internet as well. Um, but yeah, fortunately for everyone, I'm both stupid and thorough, so we're going to get there. Okay, so rather than coming up with anything myself, I thought, well, let's reproduce some significant results. Okay, this is a common, common learning technique, so let's, let's do it together. So let's break down some theory. So, the first techniques we're going to use are random forests and neural networks. Uh, we're probably not going to get to convolutional networks, I'll just talk about them, and then we'll get to word vectorization and there's some pretty funny stuff buried in there. So hands up who went to the random forest talk already. Okay, lots of people. So 
that covered it better than what I'm going to cover, except that I will include aspects of applying them in practice that perhaps weren't presented there. So random forests, they're like, they're like the merge sort of machine learning. Like they work well almost all of the time with predictable results. They, they are your baseline. If you are trying to, to achieve a level of performance, divide it by the level of performance you get out of a random forest to understand whether you truly have uh, exceeded a baseline level of expectation. Um, and and we'll, go, we'll see how well they perform relative to some of the other examples and how much benefit you get by pursuing a more sophisticated approach fairly soon. So a random forest is what's called an ensembling technique, uh, which means that, that, that you're running many, many single trained examples at the same time. Ensembling techniques seem to work better. Um, I have not found very many satisfying explanations of why they perform so much better, but they certainly do. Um, in, intuitively, what you can imagine is that uh, they're used to strike the balance between something called overfitting uh, versus uh, being able to cover off all the examples. Overfitting is kind of like memorizing without understanding. So overfitting is where you have some kind of data set. And perhaps I should, I'm just going to take a little aside because I'm about explaining what's the fundamental workflow of a machine learning problem. Um, so I've had people who haven't you know, necessarily followed that and it's a lot of the presentations today haven't really assessed it either. Now, almost all machine learning problem is about generalizing from some subset of thing to some superset of things. Uh, that might be the past and the future. It might be me versus other people. It might be my current set of people that I'm selling things to relative to all of the people that I would like to sell things people to. So the, the fundamental relationship isn't just trying to memorize what you have now. You, the, the implicit assumption is that there are some people you don't necessarily know about or some examples you don't necessarily know about. And you want to be able to know things about those people even though you don't have all of those information. And by people, I mean samples, examples, occurrences. You know, you might be doing, you might be doing some kind of, you know, uh, physical measurements of something and you want to understand what other somethings are going to behave like. It's a way of understanding uh, examples, uh, a superset of examples based on a subset. So in general, what you have is a bunch of stuff you know about. And you don't re it, it's not necessarily cheap to get more data. You kind of work within that, that boundary. And then generally what you will do is you will train one of these algorithms on, on that data. But then you're left with this question, which is like, OK, I memorized that data really well, but is that going to mean that I can actually talk about those things that I haven't seen before? Fundamentally, is the world I know about going to be like the world I don't know about, and will my algorithm perform well? So one of the things that, that's generally done is you take that, that data set, the world that you do know about, and you kind of like cut it up into some bits. And so you take some subset of the things you know about and use it to predict the other subset of things you know about but didn't tell your algorithm about. So it's, it's like testing. You know? So there's, there's the training set and there's, there's the testing set. And that, that's the language that will be used. So me, most data science presentations will, without any particular form of introduction, expect you to understand training sets, test sets, and validation sets. And the validation set is like an additional slice that's like the test set but is used in a, a slightly different way. And we, we will cover that when we get into the details. So in general, you will take your training set, you will train one of these examples, and then you will get some intuition about how well that's likely to perform out in the wide world based on its performance of stuff that you secretly didn't tell your algorithm about in the first place. Have I made any sense with that explanation? Hands up if you followed. Brilliant. We've got a room full of people who are happy to put their hands up at drop of a hat. That's wonderful. OK, so, so what I'm saying here when I say neural networks are good but they explode randomly is that if you give them a new fundamentally, or well not even fundamentally, somewhat different set of data that you're trying to train to, some neural network architectures will just be fine and then others will just, even though they performed well on apparently similar problems, just not give you the result they want. And that's generally called something like converging. Because that's what that like that's how neural networks start bad and get better, and the getting better is called converging, and the failure to converge is something you'll hear about if you're reading an article. Failure to converge just means it it's just it doesn't 
It never gets there. It never figures out what's going on. And then word vectorization is, can be understood as a neural network because it, that's how it's built. Um, but it's there's actually something, in my opinion, that's more fundamentally interesting about this than just the fact a neural network is used to achieve the result. So let's take some of that intuition and take a look at processing some images. So we're going to tackle random forests and neural networks. And should be easy, right? So random forest explanation roughly is about a, a subdivision of that data set according to some kind of test. And the test might be like, with, like what the weather conditions are, for example. And if you, you might find that segregates the data. Well, overcast segregates the data really well. The other two are kind of balanced. But one way or another, you, you use this test to segregate your data into some further subdivision. And you keep iterating until you have either completely segregated your data into unique subdivisions, in which case all you need to do to predict the future is follow your decision tree, and you're done, um, or into likelihood bins. So for example, at this level, there's like a, a two-thirds chance, uh, sorry, a two-fifths chance of don't play and a three-fifths chance of play, for example. So you can get likelihoods out of these things by storing multiple things in the same bin. And a random forest uses a lot of these and like sums the total and divides by the number of forests and you're done. Why there's, people seem to prefer like, you know, these sort of plain averages to weighted averages, which I don't really understand. But nonetheless, that appears to be what people do more often. So there you go. So that's random forest. Um, neural networks are typically de de depicted in training, uh, in like online web pages. If you go, what is a neural net? You will get a picture like this, because that's what I got when I went, what is a neural net? Um, and yes, at some level, this tells you like the academic theoretical structure of how you get from A to B. If you want to understand one computationally, you need to understand this picture. But they're not, that doesn't really tell you a lot about like how they feel and how they work and how they act in practice. Um, because it's very unclear like really why it works effectively, why it is that neural net nets can effectively train and learn a broad set of results. So I'm not really going to concentrate on it. I will go through a few key concepts. Uh, just so that we, we can talk about when we're building up the neural networks, what some of those parts are. So the input layer, they're just like the values, right? They're the, like the numbers in your spreadsheet or the, the, pixel, the pixel intensities on a grayscale image or something like that, or the word ID number out of some, some set of words. Like if you gave all of the words in a dictionary a number, you could, and you, you had like a piece of text, and then it was like, you know, one, nine, four thousand, two. You could, you could just give those numbers and then train the neural net to do something with those numbers. And that's where we'll go with word to vec Hidden layers is stuff in the middle that does some processing. And output nodes are the thing that produces like a final number. Obvious things like yes or no, was this an insulting tweet, give it all of the words, do something in the middle, get a yes or a no. Um, and you can get more complicated results by having multiple output nodes which collectively form some kind of semantic answer to your question. Nodes have activation functions. Um, roughly, this is you get an input number, you look it up over here, and you get a, a number out the other side. Same thing over there. This one constrains things to between 0 and 1, which is a generally useful thing to do. This one is a proportionate response to the input, which turns out to be more useful than you might think. And then these have various sort of tuning parameters, and they're the kind of things that the the, the computer naturally searches the parameter space of, of how to configure a network of, of those nodes, which are constitutive functions like this, to get some kind of output. But that's pretty academic, right? So let's, go, let's jump into some IPython notebooks and, and go have a look at it. Where is my web browser? There, oh, it's over here, and I can't read it. Where is my mouse cursor? No. And this screen is to my left, which is super confusing. And OK, so the MNIST data set. So simple eight iterations. That sounds, sounds pretty solid. I'm going to need to sit down here and watch my own presentation. This is crazy. Uh, I suspect if I try to not 
to reconfigure my display so I can see my own screen will just will just fall over and collapse. So I'll just continue to, to push with this one. Um, all right, so apologies for some of the stilting. Okay, so all right, anyone who's working along uh, in the top level directory of that uh, of that checkout, go type ipython space notebook. So type IPython notebook. So if you, okay, so first of all, you need to know how to activate your virtual environment using Anaconda. Um, so you type source activate, and then if you've given the name, if you've used the name like as in the script, you use ADS. That was the name, Applied Data Science, and suddenly you'll get you'll you'll get some information that that's happened. I've done it differently. Uh, so I've done it with a, with a path, and then you'll get some, some guff like that that says you're ready to go. Uh, and then you change to the relevant directory. I've got this open in another terminal, so I won't do it. And then you type ipython notebook. Right. Now, if, you've, if you only get this far in this tutorial, Great, you've just learned a whole lot of stuff. You've managed to use the Anaconda Python installer. You've got a whole lot of worked examples you can just follow through at home. You've managed to get the IPython notebook working if that's a technology you've never used before. That's more important than all of the other stuff in this presentation because it's one of the most fundamental you know, like performance gains you can get when doing this kind of experimental work. So we're done. Yes, question? I can try. All right, yes, yes, I can make it bigger. OK, so then, actually, that helps me too, because now I can read it better too. OK, so, except I didn't make this one bigger. This is just the debug screen. It launches, a web browser will probably come up automatically, and and you will see, you'll see something like, uh, like this, and then you click on MNIST, you go find one of these, and you go run them. Now, all of the ones that say simple, um, oh wait, That's super annoying. Okay, so uh, they're named relatively okay, so there's basic simple eight iterations. Okay, we want random forest 100 estimators, actually, is the one we want. So 100 estimators is the default parameterization of the random forest in scikit-learn. Um, it works well, but a thousand will work better most of the time um, at some risk of overfitting um, and a, a definite computational cost. Okay, so then there's a bunch of boilerplate up here which you don't need to read and a bunch of boilerplate here which you also isn't especially relevant um, and is all about how to load the data off disk. Um, it should not take very long to run. I don't suggest reading it and trying to understand it. I just suggest executing it and moving on. Okay, so now we execute our load data, 2.3 seconds. And now this is, this is reforming our training data because the, this just happens to be how it's structured internally. X and Y is like the, the, the preconditions with the target expected values. For whatever reason, Y tends to be frequently used to mean the truth about what actually happened X tends to mean kind of your hypothesis. So MNIST data, I didn't really explain it before. Hang on, I'm to the right of that screen. MNIST data looks like this. It's a digit. It's, a, it's one of these, like one hand-drawn digit at about at this level of resolution, at this level of quality. Um, some of the examples are clear and easy to read. Some of them, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that is an eight, but it's more poorly, uh, less legible. Um, and then there are some examples, none on the screen, which are truly a challenge. Like you could certainly see this might be, this could be like a terribly drawn six over on the side. My brain says it's probably a five. Uh, and there are some that are, that are even more challenging to read than those. So first of all, you're probably not going to get perfect performance because some of these things are fundamentally hard. So 
if you want to try and do something like this at home and you can establish a baseline of human performance, that's more interesting than presenting the automatic performance by itself. You, know, you can ne never assume that the people are perfect, never assume that your training and test data is per has perfectly categorized the things. There's every chance that whoever was saying what the truth about this is set a six when really the person actually meant to write a five or vice versa. So if you can uh, baseline against like human expert or average human performance, the more relative data uh, points you can get, the better. Um, okay, so that's, that's what we're looking at. So it's image data. So every square of, of one X is the pixel values for one of those digits. Uh, and the Y is the integer uh, the value that that is. Okay, so, okay, so then we, we reprocess this, reshape this data. So what's interesting here is we're flattening it out. So instead of like a square icon where you might think like the relationship between some of those pixels has some kind of meaning to you as a human, don't even worry about it. Th this threw me for a long time. I truly didn't understand that what was happening is this was just treating it as 784 values all just kind of next to each other with no spatial thought whatsoever. So one of the most mindless approaches tr to try to recognize an image I can think of pays no comprehension to the semantics at all. It just says there are 784 values and we're going to try to learn what that, what that order of those values tends to mean in general. Okay, so then that, that cranks away for a minute. I oh, know, for a very short amount of time, I didn't notice the M. Uh, okay, so now what we're doing is we're setting up, setting up our learning algorithm so, and fitting it to the data. So the whole thing's going to take 45 seconds. So is anyone down to executing this cell yet? Yes, brilliant. Um, okay, how, how much time did it, did it, did anyone take more than 10 seconds longer than 45 seconds? No. Okay, brilliant. So it's a, it's a very robust algorithm with respect to the amount of time you can expect it to take. So what we're doing here is I've got, this is like the number of CPUs to distribute over, and this is the number of estimators or the number of individual decision trees which compose our forest. And there we go, we have one. Now, we don't know how that performed particularly on what we trained. We want to know how it performed on data that the algorithm hasn't seen before. So we go through and we play with our test data and we do the same process to it and we execute a prediction. So the time taken to actually do the prediction is 1.2 seconds. So these algorithms are much faster to evaluate with than they are to train in the first place. So if you're going to build one, don't train it multiple times. But they are fast enough to, once trained, reuse many times for the same task in a reasonable time frame with so like 1.2 seconds is probably too slow for like a web page, but you know, maybe it's not depending on your web page and there's been absolutely no effort at optimizing here at all. Um, and I'm, sure, I'm sure that you could uh, call out to something more efficient if you're trying to build something at web speed. Um, okay, so then we're gonna go right out of our examples. How many did we get correct and incorrect? So we got, uh, Roughly nine, ten, you know, nine thousand correct and roughly a thousand incorrect. So, unsurprisingly, that leads to a ninety percent success rate. So, we did no thinking, we did no data pre-processing. I mean, to some extent, yes, I'm using CAN data, so at some level, it's been like scanned and stored as JPEG files and categorized. But I haven't, I haven't normalized it. I haven't changed the image sizes. I haven't generated more test data to try to get a better result. I've just gone, here's the data I've got, here's an algorithm I didn't tune, here's 90% success rate. And depending on how fundamentally difficult your problem is, you'll see those kinds of numbers on real world problems. It's a, it's th that is an entirely representative level of performance for a random forest. So um, examples of where this is used in practice is, you know, like postcode digit boxes when you send your mail around. Use not this process, but this approach to the process. Machine learning is, is, to the best of my knowledge, how they do that kind of recognition. Okay, so that's great. So let's try to understand how we can do better. Should we try to do better on this example? So same problem, 10 times as many members in our ensemble. Seen all of this before. So 
for 10 times the number of members in the ensemble, we get a barely recognizable increase in performance. There is an increase in performance. What's about 30 odd extra examples, you know, have moved out of incorrect and into correct, so that went somewhere. There are other parameterizations of the random forest I, didn't, I haven't yet tried. It, perhaps some of those hold some great truth, some great ex sudden leap forward in performance. Um, but I will be moving on to other fundamentally different techniques rather than sticking with random forests at this stage. Um, so exercise for the audience while I'm speaking. Jump onto the Google Docs, find out the other parameterizations for random forests, and tell me if you can outperform these algorithms based on the random forest approach. I truly don't know what the answer is. Okay, so let's talk about how we would approach that uh, with a neural network. So what we have here is something called, uh, is going to use eight iterations. So neural networks are trained one, one iteration at a time. Now I'll get past the guff, restructure the data, and now here, here's us building, building our neural network. Now, can I increase? Maybe I can make this even bigger. Okay. So let's talk about what a neural network is made out of layers. It's, it's like an ogre, it's, it's got layers. So th some of these turn out to be absolutely key. Some of them you can kind of just choose any, any one of a number of reasonable alternatives. So most neural network tutorials will tell you to do most of these things. Very few of them will tell you why. And so I went and I said, well, I'm just going to try them without those because it seemed like a simpler introduction and a simpler thing to understand to not use all of these layers. And then I ran into a whole lot of brick walls and I'm back at where people told me to go in the first place, but now I have a solid understanding of why. So things that are important. Uh, this Keras library is, I'm fairly convinced, the most usable way to approach neural networks in Python bar none. Um, so there's a few reasons for that. One is, is it won't leave you trapped on your CPU if you have a GPU that you can use. And trust me, if you get into this stuff, you will want to use a GPU. Uh, secondly, the Keras documentation is very strong with many examples of which I've lifted one. Um, so I, ha I have kind of like hand built my own approach to a neural network and then I'm like, you know what, their example works great. So they have, they have a bunch of different problem space domain examples that you can take and adapt to your problem. It's got very active development and it's pretty easy to understand and use. So I, if nothing else, just remember if you want to take something for a spin, I do propose starting here. There are, there are many alternatives. There would be at least 10 different alternative libraries that you could choose. They all have their strengths and their weaknesses. This is a, this is a very, uh, can apply very broadly to many of the problems you'll be faced with. In some circumstances, there will be others that are more appropriate. Okay, so what are we doing here? So first of all, we're going to talk about a sequential model, uh, which means basically we can apply the concepts that are relevant to building a neural network one after the other. So the concepts that we're going to apply are something called dense layer connection, something called dropout, something called activation, something called batch normalization, something called a linear rectifier, and something called, uh, and we're going to do something called scaling our inputs. Uh, now, what I might do is jump down to the bottom and convince you that this work is worth doing. So if we jump down to the bottom, what you'll see is that after doing all of this work, we're going to land at 98% accuracy, give or take a brick. So that's actually a pretty, that, that's pretty worthwhile. There are things you can do with a tool that's 98% accurate that you can't do with a tool that's 90% accurate. Both are good, this one's undeniably performs better, but it's going to require you to do some more work to get that level of result. So I initially started with this three layer model because this sequence of what you'll see is that these four lines here are essentially repeats of this here. The first neural network I ever built consisted of the whole stack because it was based off an example and then I progressively removed them to understand where the performance boundary lies. This comes back to the fundamental inexplicable nature of neural networks is that there's no real reason why anyone could explain why one or the other would do, do better. Like there are conceptual discussions you can have like 
because there are so many layers here, you can't get all of the the way the way neural networks learn is they try this layer and then they t if you're successful you you reinforce the current beliefs of each layer is, is kind of the way to think about it conceptually it's called reinforcement learning but if you have a you could imagine that as an unstable situ an unstable uh, situation where like both the input both the layer near the beginning and the layer near the end both get yes you did well please do more of whatever you did but they're actually in opposition to each other in some way. So they'll learn in an opposite direction, and the next time they see that example, they'll get uh, reinforced in the other direction, and they will essentially simply oscillate, and they will fail to come to some kind of agreed way to react to the input. If your network is too big, there is not enough signal to overcome the, the, the vibrations of the network, as it will, as it were. So something that's worth doing is to try to come up with a a simpler explanation for the computer to use for trying to represent the information and the prediction states that are coming in. Okay, so that's what I've done there. Okay, so we have something called a sequential layer. We have a dense input, uh, dense layer of our inputs. Um, we have this thing called a linear rectifier, uh, uh, which I'm just going to skip over, I'm afraid. Then we have something called batch normalization. So. For image-like tasks and most numerical tasks, neural networks just perform better if all of the information that comes in has a similar mean and a similar variance and goes between 0 and 1. And they just do. Um, and the, the, these techniques here are about trying to, give, trying to do that to your input. The nature of the batch is that you train on multiple samples, you do the reinforcement on the performance across multiple samples at the same time. So instead of going, how did you go, like if you need to um, you know, classify someone into at PyCon or not at PyCon, instead of going person by person, you'll take like five people at a time, evaluate the results for all of them, and then train the network on its aggregate performance. Um, and, the and that essentially results in a more stable training process because it doesn't kind of wander off along some particular examples and have to come back again. The, the, it's a more reasonable way to assess the results to address them in batches, hence batch normalization. Then there's this thing called dropout. So you may remember from that example there were lines going everywhere. You can have network um, architectures which don't have lines going everywhere, they just go somewhere. Rather than actually trying to come up with the optimized set of lines which go places, what we do is we randomly ignore 50% of the connections on each cycle. Um, and that, allow, that means that the network doesn't get kind of too focused on, ver on some very specific connections and allows it once again to, to train in a more general way. Um, and so all of those things, and, and back up here somewhere, we did an initial uh, input scaling of the whole data set to between zero and one to make it more consistent. So we've done those things. All of those things are pretty important. You could probably, probably drop the linear rectifier in this case, because probably all the input data is positive valued anyway. Um, but if you have negatively, negatively valued input data, in some circumstances, this can be worth doing. If the sign of the result is relevant, I mean, like, we're only predicting positive numbers here. You know, there's no negative one in the output. We don't need to really, this example doesn't include, you know, positive or negative as really part of its thinking. So you may need to use that, that later on. Okay, so let's see. So we've gone, we've got pre-processed data, we've described our model, we know we're going to land at 90%. Let's talk about how long it takes. So each one of these cycles is taking kind of 20 seconds. Straight, straight away we've, we've gone up to close to four minutes. And this is just for a little, you know, little kind of 32 by 32 size, you know, piece of information. So straight away what you can see is that the amount of time taken is, you know, it's dramatically larger and for a, a more complex issue, you will take you know, really quite a lot longer. Um, if you're just training on a CPU on a laptop, there will be plenty of examples where you can tell it to train and just wander away and it will take all night and that's how long it's going to take to do a train. And there are even more examples where it'll just essentially never come back. Um, so you do need to be a bit careful. You, you can't apply these to every problem necessarily. Um, if you use your GPU, particularly and I, I don't like playing favorites, but NVIDIA are ahead on their support for the libraries that are in Python now. 
if you have an NVIDIA GPU and use that with, the, with this library, you will basically get a fairly reliable factor of 10 improvement on the speed taken for each of these things. There are ways to get more out of the Intel GPUs, but they rely on other libraries and there's just a whole rabbit hole of what works with what thing. Um, there's nothing wrong with an NVIDIA GPU, they just don't have the same level of library support right now for the tools that are easiest to use right now. Okay, so, so we spent three and a half minutes training the thing. How well, how long does it actually take to do the prediction? Well, that's very similar. So the amount of time taken to do the prediction is the similar approximately second that we saw, oh, 1.2 seconds, I think, was the random forest. This one's very slightly smaller. I wouldn't pay attention to that degree of time difference. But what that does mean is it allows us to front load our computation. So if we have some difficult task and we need to rec you know, classify some things into some categories, we can front load our computation into the understanding part of the problem, then the computer understands it, and then we can fairly quickly you know, churn out some kind of machine that's going to actually you know, do this recognition many, many times in practice. Okay, so eight iterations is not very many. Um, anywhere from eight to 30 would be a common number of iterations to train a neural network for. Um, an amount of time to spend training anywhere from five minutes to an hour is a common amount of time for a neural network to need to train. Um, so let's see, let's see on at least just like one example, how much further can we get by just extending the number of iterations, for example. So roughly the same level of explanatory power available to the system, so the same, basically the same network architecture, but we're just going to keep going for some more time to try to get it to do better. Okay, so now we've spent seven and a half minutes. What did we get for our extra four minutes? Okay, for our extra four minutes, we get about like kind of two, well, I think the, I think the last one was all, so like 0.005%. So like, like a really small, well not 0 .00, 0.005 or half a percent. So not nothing. You know, if you really want that extra bit, because some, you know, that extra little sort of like grade, some things will benefit from that, and you know, that's great. Your process control will have improved, but the amount of work is not what I would call really proportionate to the amount of benefit that you get out of it. Now, if you want to try to be, you know, the very best you can be, you will need to spend time trying to work out how to kind of optimize things further than what you see here, and you will need to try more network configurations and more kinds of training and more kinds of parameterization and different sets of input layers. And you can do that by hand, or you can throw it at something called grid search, which was brought up earlier, which is basically just a big loop over all of these different combinations of parameters, go away and just tell me which one did best. So you can automate sort of the search through the sort of meta parameter space of these things, uh, which is great it will take you a very long time because it's seven and a half, even for this example, it's seven and a half minutes per pop. As soon as, you know, if, as soon as you want to, you know, multiply that by 10 in order to get through, a, a, you know, even a limited combination of parameter spaces, it's going to take you a long time. So you either want a lot of computing resources or you really don't want to bother. Like for toy examples, not this, this isn't exactly a toy example. This can solve a real problem like postcodes. It's not nothing. But for a simple example or a toy example, you probably wouldn't really bother at home. But if you want to go away and, and get into taking these things further, you know, that's something you might want to do. Um, OK, so that, that pretty much covers us off for, for Random Forest. Um, and, sorry, and neural networks and MNIST. So. I'm to the right of that screen, and I want to bring my slide back. Okay, so we've talked about images. All right, did, who managed to get through some, who got a neural network trained? Hey, that's fantastic. Congratulations, everyone, you did it. Who, for, who was the, who, for who was that the first neural network they'd trained? Yeah, kind of like, you know, maybe about half of those people. Okay, well, congratulations, you got a thing done. I feel, I feel like I can stop now. All right, so what's next? Natural language processing. Well, that's a change, of course. We've just gone from images to text. They're like they're pretty different, right? Pretty different. I, I, hands up, who's ever done some computation trying to link thinking about images to thinking about text? 
Nothing. Excellent. Nailed it. No one's here to spoil my fun. So nobody in this room, or I mean myself, obviously, no one else in this room has ever, has ever gone, you know what, I really want to think about images and text and how they relate to each other in some way. So that means if you're trying to find, if, if you're trying to do like, you know, product recommendations, nobody here has tried to go on, I'm not going to just compare the text of these products. I'm going to take a picture of these products and compare how similar these pictures are and use that as well as how similar these text searches are to optimize their movie recommendation, for example. Um, so, so there are lots of problems where that might be relevant. Google image search would also be relevant. I want a picture of a thing that's doing this other thing and, you know, and then find me similar pictures based on the image characteristics rather than the word characteristics. Okay, so. The thing that can do that is this same kind of vectorized representation. We saw how to throw an image at a random forest now, and, and a neural network. Now let's have a look at how we can throw some text at, at those exact same things. Now I don't go all the way to now let's take those two things and use them, use them in an integrated system, but it very much points the way. Uh, I also don't bother with Markov models. That should just get removed from the slide. But they're a fun thing to play with. Okay, so what we're going to do here is build a word to vec Twitter bot. Hands up who's heard of word to vec Okay. word to vec is a thing that is wor bears its own explanation. So I've actually forgotten what time I have to finish up. Let me just have a quick look at uh, when I'm due to stop rambling on. Okay, I have got until 3 o'clock, so I've still got 40 minutes left. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about word to vec because just going through the example shouldn't really take us very long. We may, we may melt the internet when we all try to load Twitter at the same time, but other than that, it should be pretty straightforward. It basically just works. What I'm going to propose is that for people who want to do this on their own machine, they begin, they, they, they load up one of the notebooks in particular because there's a bit of processing time involved in that notebook, um, and then, then I'll, I'll get onto the talking stuff. So if you go uh, back up to the top level and jump into Word to Vec, Okay, so there's a few files worth thinking about. Now, in here, there's this file. Now, I'm fairly sure this is just an empty text file. Yes. If you have a Twitter API set up, you can put your details into here and do a live Twitter feed based example uh, along, along with me. Uh, also, you can. Uh, I've got. Do I have my pickle results here? See, this, there's this tweets.pickle file. Now, I'm fairly sure I've pushed that up to the repository and you should be able to get that. That represents basically my timeline at a particular moment in time. And so that gives us some cached results so that you don't necessarily need a Twitter account to make all this stuff working. Okay, then what you're going to need is there's this, uh, just this word to vec one here. And basically just go execute all of the cells. And so this will produce a whole lot of data that the algorithm needs to work. So just do that. You may, there may be some errors. There might be some path-related issues or some, like text 8's probably zipped in the repository. You probably need to do a manual unzip, th those kinds of little things. But by and large, there really should, this should just go from top to bottom. Um, so you might maybe do that while I'm talking, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what word to vec is and how it works. Uh, so let me get my on to the right of that screen. That's super weird. Play from there. OK. So some of this slide talks about general natural language processing techniques, some of it's specific to word to vec So an enormous amount of natural language processing is based on the idea of a corpus of knowledge. Um, and it'll generally be plain text. Um, and an example would be all of the text on Wikipedia. Another example might be the King James Bible. Another example might be War and Peace. Another example might be your Twitter history. Basically something where you go, well, somehow expressed in all of this text is the stuff that I want my computer to be able to know about, reason about, and react to. Uh, and the, the, the word for that is the corpus. Um, if you do a Google search for like natural language generation corpus, you'll find a lot of different examples. There's a thing called the Natural Language Toolkit, which will let you download standard corpuses and, and things along those lines. Uh, I, the one that I've included is this file called Text8, which I think is just like eight million, like 
an eight million word long set of sentences from somewhere like Wikipedia that someone assembled for me. I didn't take the trouble to particularly understand it beyond I believe it's just commonly used English language text. So first of all, it does not need to be English language text. It can be any language you want and the algorithm should be fairly invariant to that. Probably there are some limits around, because it's tokenized into words, so languages that have that aren't based on separate words for their meanings but have a lot going on in terms of like prefixes and suffixes and that's how you build your sentences. You might need to break those out into separate tokens for the purposes of word to vec but for this audience for right now using that text file will give us more than adequate results. You get hilarious results when you do things like take all rap lyrics and the King James Bible and smush them together and call that the corpus. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. Okay, so we've picked a body of knowledge, we've saved it onto disk, it's, um, I suppose these days it would be Unicode, but it'll generally be ASCII text because life's simpler that way, uh, and that will represent the training set. So what your notebooks will now be doing is going through and processing that into some intermediate files for the use of this word to vec algorithm. Okay, so then we've got these, these, you know, this sort of big, set, you know, database of words called the corpus, now we need to represent that to the machine. And things are about to get philosophical. So first of all, you've got to ask yourself, what are you representing to the machine? Are you representing the syntax or are you representing the concept? So a lot of word generation, well, hands up who's thought of a Markov model. Oh, not thought of, heard of a Markov model. <laughs> yeah. Clearly that was an important semantic difference because some people claim to have invented the Markov model, many people claim to have used them. Um, <laughs> okay, so a, a Markov model is it's pretty syntactic, right? Okay, it looks like this specific word followed by this other specific word followed by this other specific word has some kind of frequency or likelihood of occurrence. It's based pretty much on the syntax. In my view, what the word to vec algorithm doing, is doing, first of all, it gives each of those a numbered ID. So it takes every word that you've got in your corpus and takes it back to an integer. And that's, that's the number of that word. And then, you, then it uses that, the neural network to train it on sequences of words followed by the word that comes after that. Now, for example, pick up the bottle. Okay, then it's got one example of where the words pick and up and that were followed by the word bottle and you might have another one which is like pick up the pencil case if you somehow have that as one word pick up the case something along those lines so you have now two examples and you have all of these sort of statistical likelihoods of what's going to follow what but the thing that we're going to land at it with word to vec is that it starts to learn to fundamentally understand the relationships not between the syntaxes but between the concepts and the way that that's demonstrated is that syntactically different words that are conceptually similar end up being close to each other. And by close to each other, I mean in what is an abstract but physically dimensioned space. So let's just take our time to get through all of that. So we take, we've got our large set of words, we bring it back to a set of integers, we feed it into a neural network, which we saw before, was considered all of those input nodes, um, and each word has, has an ID number. Now, instead of going like it's a one or it's an eight or it's a seven, what we do is we've, we've, we vectorize that. So instead of it being the integer seven, what you'll have is, suppose you happen to be working with uh, a corpus consisting of 10 words because it's simple enough to talk about, what you will have is zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero called a one-hot encoding. Uh, seems to make sense. I don't know why they didn't just call it vectorized, but nonetheless, one-hot encoding is, is, is refers to that technique of taking an integer, having a vector of the length of the number of things that you're talking about, and then having the value one in the position that refers to the value of the thing. Um, and then what we do is that, okay, so say, say bottle is, is word number, you know, 5,000 in our corpus or something like that. We then start to train our neural network. And what we do is we start to learn activation functions associated with all of those particular positions. So what we try to do is we try to train the, the input, la the, the layer next to the input layer starts to kind of represent a vector of information about our bottle as it pertains to all of the other concepts that also exist. So 
you know, a bottle might be similar to glass in some way. So uh, I haven't dived down into the actual values encoded into the actual networks, but like conceptually, if the, you know, if they're, if they're three apart from each other, after some training, you will find elements of activation related to the glass concept in the vector for the bottle concept, and vice versa. So the, the neural network training starts to give you some kind of information like in that vector fundamentally about how similar these concepts are. And it uses this concept of, um, and it lays them out in a Euclidean space and it uses a function called the cosine distance to determine the similarity of the words. I don't really know what that means exactly. I believe it essentially refers to if you had a two-dimensional space instead of some kind of arbitrarily huge dimensional space, it would be literally the difference in the angle between something that's like 0, 1 and 0, 5. And then you would come up and you would literally get an angle, like a number between 0 and 1 that is the number of probably radians between those two things. It's a very physical concept. So what we have here is we're taking all of the words bringing them back to integers, and then laying them out physically according to their similarity to one another in some kind of multi-dimensional space, which I can't think about. What, but what that means is that you can start to do maths on these things. You can go like uh, king minus man plus woman equals queen and get those kinds of numbers back so instead of using the neural network necessarily to do the prediction, you can actually use these mathematical spatial concepts to actually move in a physical, you know, in a physical sense, in a spatial sense, between your concepts. And I don't really know what to make of that, except that it, it does explode my mind. And it strikes me that, that this is used as, some, as evidence that there is more than just a statistical relationship or a likelihood relationship going on here, but that, the, that, that in some sense the network has, has understood the semantics of what's going on, understood that these things are semantically related to each other, that's why I'm saying it's storing the concept number rather than the word number, and it's laid these out in some kind of organized way. Now it's certainly not perfect, but the fact that it's any good at all is kind of amazing. Okay, so let's jump into, so with any luck, these neural networks will have trained by now. Uh, so I'm to the right of that screen, so there's my mouse. So it took me, yeah, sure. So it took me like, uh, so this text eight phrases things, the thing that like identifies pencil case as a single concept even though it's two words and does some of that kind of, some, that, some of that kind of business. And I presume that, I'm, I'm guessing, but conceptually this would be the same thing as in another language which is based on prefixes and suffixes like tokenizing them out to separate concepts. Okay, then we come up with these clusters, and then we and and that, that clustering, I believe, is is the fitting I was talking about. So that took kind of a minute and a half, um, and now we can start to load that cached file, and we can do some things with it. So we can say, what are the things in our data set that have the closest spatial relationship to a dog? Uh, and it's come up with cat, cow. Goat, rat, you know, it's come up with a bunch of things that broadly have four legs and have various other similarity relationships to a dog. Uh, why a cow is more similar to a dog than a rat is anybody's guess. Uh, it will go back to the, the, number, the frequency of word use related to those things in similar sentences. So perhaps because a dog is more positively, dogs and cows are both reasonably positively associated, I'm guessing. This is the fundamental fundamentally inexplicable nature of neural networks. I'm inventing explanations so that you can, to, to give you a, you know, to prime the intuition. I'm making this stuff up. As far as I can tell, everyone else on the internet is also making this stuff up because the computer doesn't understand what I'm trying to explain to you. It just works. Um, so there are probably machine learning researchers out there who truly have a research level grasp of what's going on. They're probably very upset that I'm giving such a bad presentation, but nonetheless, it's the one that I can give. So that's what's going on. So those are the kinds of, so there you go. Like, I'm pretty impressed, okay? So that's, that's like a domestic, an, you know, an indoor animal, so it's a dog. Cows, you know, farm animal. Dogs are working animals. You know, there's those sorts of concepts. I can kind of see how 
these things, you know, they're, they're all animals, which is a win. It hasn't picked door or, you know, anything, or, or a toy. You know, you could imagine a toy dog. It hasn't decided that a toy is closer than these other kinds of animals. And all of this is based on this ordering of this cosine distance, the spatial similarity in the laying out of these concepts. So that's kind of pretty, pretty interesting, really. Okay, so now I thought, well, what can I do just to sort of take this stuff for a spin? So what I decided I could do is that I could build a Twitter bot that made memes. So I did that. So I've ins imported a whole bunch of things. I've loaded up my, uh, my uh, word to vec data. I've fetched my, oh, these things don't look like they've been executed. All right, let's just do it. Yay, live demo, but very canned. Okay, so we've got some, got some tweets. So this is dangerous. I hope no one in this data set happened to have uh, tweeted me anything uh, controversial. This is, I, I never wired this up to the internet because you never know when someone's going to tweet something, you know, like, you know, just slightly off color. And then the algorithm is going to randomly pick the two worst associated words and then extrapolate that to something completely inappropriate. So that, 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 I guess, goes back to our keynote. Don't let the machine think for you. You know, this will definitely ruin your Twitter feed if you just wire it up. Don't say I told you to do this. <laughs> okay, but it is, it is pretty good fun. Now, and, and if you, there, there are some things you could do to actually wire it up live, like, you know, have some banned words and, and make it pick the most relevant word from a sentence. So there are a lot of ex extensions to this that if you were going to uh, do this in a creative and, and humorous way, you could definitely pull it off. Okay, so let's see what's sitting in this timeline here. So, oh, okay, it's just a blurg of JSON, uh, JSON data. Maybe further down this notebook, we're gonna get get the readable version because I'd definitely pull that out at some stage. Okay, so, all right, so yeah, maybe up, maybe after this cell we'll get some relevant stuff. Uh, insert cell above. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I've gone through my timeline. I've tried to get long words as some kind of proxy because words like in and as and but and ah uh don't give you very interesting data to work with. There are techniques uh, for extracting the most, in, like kind of the most relevant words out of a sentence. Um, so there's some some natural language learning we could use there, but whatever we get we get some t we get a tweet out at the end of this. So let's let's see what we got anyway. Uh, now I, I did actually read through these tweets at one point and decided that they were at least tolerable for public consumption. Uh, it's still pretty unreadable. All right, maybe a bit further down my cell we'll get something more readable. There'll be some text at some point. Okay, uh, tweet.txt, there we go, that's what I need to pull out. Okay, there we go. That sound, well, okay, so coffee wagon, that sounds relatively, so currently still in police protective. Okay, so probably it would be okay. I'm, I'm really hoping we pick like wagon and found and not like police and appeal for the rest of this example. Just like forgive me if that happens, that's not the intention. Um, but it, 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 do, it will expose you to some of those concepts about, you know, relying on machine al learning algorithms. Okay, so what we do here is we then split it into, oh, we've done that. Uh, I'll just do it again. Okay, so now what we're going to do, what we're doing here is pulling some words out of these positions. So I've got this, this uh, list here called WS for words. So let's see what words I have chosen. And then if I don't like those words, I can, I can, you know, get in there and oh, get in there and hand assign hand assign a few different words. Okay, bean appears in police. All right, so just for the sake of myself, I'm gonna do bean uh, tomorrow and appears. Okay, there we go. They seem nice and safe. Uh, now, there is the potential to use an additional word here as well, uh, which I use for doing an image meme search uh, in a minute. So I will go Python. Okay. So then we get, we do an analogy where we're saying bean is to tomorrow as appears is to question mark. 
Um, and so we're, and then using this um, uh, uh, saying, so we're supplying the association. So being is to tomorrow as what is to, you know, a, as appears is to question mark. Uh, so we go ahead and we do this. So this is, this is what we can really, this is mainly what you get to use word to vec for. You use that cosine distance to work out. So you get the cosine distance, you start at concept A, you work out the, the vector to get to concept B, and then you apply that same transition to something else and you get the analogy. A is to B is C is to D. There, there are other ways to use it, but you know, it's a good fun way. Okay. All right, so then... Oh, there we go. Oh, hang on. I shouldn't have added Python up here. I should have left it. It adds it later. Let's go back again. Okay, so I'm going to get in here and just do a little bit more of this uh, data data munging here. Uh, so let's go with. I don't want to don't want to uh, bring up anyone's anyone's name in a context like this. So I will substitute Python in here because yeah, uh, like it's a kind of an interesting thing. All of this data someone has put out there in public for resharing for common use. Yet you still have to treat it sensitively, and getting getting through that is. Uh, you know, like that's a talk in of itself. Okay, so now we've got some, some tweets and we've got the, the analogies. So what it suggested was that, you know, being as tomorrow is, was as appears is to uh, Paul Glover. So I'm not really sure how it's come up with that one. Whatever, maybe he, maybe he was found the next day, hypothetically. Again, with the making up the explanations. Okay, so now we throw that at a Google image search. And we get a meme out of it. Yay! Being is tomorrow as appears is to Python. Now I'm not. <laughs> I like the image result. That that's pretty solid. There we go. There's a meme. Um, so uh, I have I've managed I have found some images which are better than others, uh, and some images that are uh, some meme results that, that are worse than others. So I'm um, pull up one of my. Pull up one of my earlier results uh, off my blog here. Uh, all right. Uh, so I'm over here. There we go. Almost as to test as still as to spacecraft. I think that that's probably my my favourite one. It's, it would be better again if it was almost as to working as still as to spacecraft. But you know that's solid. That's a result. So every now, so you'll probably get like one in ten will bear like some recognizable level of ascents, and kind of ninety percent of them will be garbage. But it's still a much better uh, ratio than picking, say, random words out of the dictionary or something along those lines. Um, so has anyone anyone been brave enough to try to hook this thing up? Who's who's done it? One one brave fellow, two brave people. Did it did it function? Did it execute? Excellent. All right. Good job. Okay. So the rest of the presentation now really is uh, is me talking. So we've got got just coming up to twenty minutes twenty minutes left. Oh, not from the beginning. Okay. So what we're going to do now is look at some of the challenges. So we looked at um, a bit about about this. Now I'm going to talk about uh, testing your predictions, uh, which is an important thing that you should should walk away with as a concept. Uh, and then just some of the latest findings from, you know, generally from industry and from, from the latest. Okay, so how do you know if something that you've done is right? How do we know that that 90% or that 98% is a, is a good result? How do we know that, we're, that you're going to be able to get that result again in future? Um, how do you know how to explain to your boss whether something has performed well? So conceptually, this is something that people who've been involved in computer science should be pretty familiar with, which is that you basically baseline it against a known solution. So the way that that's done in computer uh, science generally is you um, have classes of problems, P and NP, for example. Um, P means it's reasonably comp computationally tractable. NP means that it's computationally intractable. If you can prove that your example uh, 
performs in it, you know, can be translated to one of those and you can baseline your performance against it. You can say something fundamentally about the general performance of your algorithm uh, and, and come up with some kind of performance metrics. The way that you do it with testing is exactly the same. You don't just say I got 98% on this, on, I can perform for all time at the level of 98% or 90% for examples you haven't seen. You need to baseline it against some kind of reference standard. So there's a few different ways to do that. Um, a few of them up there. I'm going to explain a few metrics. I'm going to explain my favorite metrics because there are many metrics. This is my all time, this is my personal favorite metric. It looks pretty complicated but conceptually it just means relative to the mean result for the truth, so the average, average likelihood that someone's at PyCon, how much for each ex example, like how much did you manage to explain of the truth? Um, so for people who are mathematically inclined, it's going to be easier to follow. So this means we've fitted, we, our, our estimation is that there's some kind of linear function. Our standard of performance is just the average and these are all of the sample results. So in this particular case, what we see here is that we predicted this point on the line here using our, our linear prediction. So we have managed to, so you square that and we go, well, that represents the area with respect to that example that we predict, predicted successfully. Uh, and this blue area here represents the area of unexplained variance and then the, the large square represents the total variance. So essentially, if you sum up those things for all of the samples, you get the ratio of the what you were successfully able to predict versus the ratio versus what you were not successfully able to predict. So essentially, it's your percentage performance of explaining error. So that, that means that at the very least, in the lieu of any real world benchmark, you go, well, the mean is a kind of reasonably standard prediction. Like it's it's about as it's about as basic as something that could actually work can get. So you go, well, that, that represents a kind of like zero order solution to the problem, is taking the mean, how did we perform with respect to that solution in explaining the error, and you get, a, you get like, I explained 90% of the error. Now, yes, it's the squared error, and you know, yes, the mean's probably not a good predictor, but that at least allows you to give, suppose you, suppose you're, performance is, you know, like relatively poor, but you can still say, you know, you still have some kind of baseline that you can perform, you can say, well, yes, it's not great, but it is much better than the mean, for example. So that, that's, the, the extension to this is that you start to change the mean, you start to change your benchmark. So you can use, you could do this same calculation it would no longer be called R squared. R squared implies the use of the mean. But you can use the same calculation to come up with metrics where uh, instead of the mean, you use the thing the random forest predict predicted, and instead of your linear result, you use the thing that your neural network predicted, and you can get a relative performance out of that. Um, the reason for squaring everything is just kind of by convention. It's, ju it's just this sort of generally held view that things that are, things that are like a lot worse should be more than proportionally penalized than things that are just a little bit worse. So the use of the squares allows you to avoid like extremely bad results. It penalizes extremely bad results. There are a lot of different kinds of measures. So for example, it might be that if you're wrong at all or to, you know, to anything other than the slightest degree, it doesn't matter how much you're wrong by, you know, you missed the plane. It does not matter how much you missed the plane by. It's a kind of binary result. In which case, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to square like how many minutes late you were for the plane. If you're if you're not there within X minutes of arrival time, you know the the fact that you you know extreme results aren't really relevant outside of those boundaries, for example. So selecting your your selecting these is somewhat complex, but the starting position for kind of everybody everywhere is to square the errors and work with that. It's just kind of accepted. The other thing that you'll see is this thing called a rock curve and the area under the curve, which you'll probably need to explain to yourself, you know, every third week for the next year before it becomes muscle memory. That's what I have to do. So I'm going to give myself like about two minutes to explain this. It's, it's coming up to, it's just past quarter two now. 
then I'm going to get through some interesting results and I'm going to hopefully have about five minutes for questions. I'm sorry if that's not enough time for questions, but we'll just, that's the way it's worked out. So this is actually something that's well worth remembering. So I'm going to go to the end and work backwards. The end is that the area under this curve is, a value is given as a value between 0 and 1, where 1 is the complete area and 0 is, not, is no explanatory power at all. Um, and you shouldn't be able to get 0, because if, you no, if, you're, if you're perfectly wrong every time, all you have to do is flip what you think and you get perfect performance. So in theory, the worst you sh if you're doing worse than 50% performance, you're actually doing better than 50% performance because you can only go halfway into a forest before you're coming out again or something like that. So, <laughs> so what, what the, what the, let's get into these axes. So down here is something called the false positive rate. So that means that like, uh, yep, no, false positive is pretty self-explanatory. And this is the true positive rate. So if I have a whole bunch of objects and you, you, you want to know how good I am at telling you whether this is a bottle or not. And you go, is that a bottle? And I say, yeah, that's a bottle. Well, that's a false positive. Is that a bottle? Yeah, that's a bottle. That's a true positive. Is that a bottle? Is that a... Now, if I just always say true, I will always correctly identify the bottles. Like, there is no room for me to incorrectly say, oh, no, that's not a bottle, because it is a bottle, and I'll say it's a bottle. So. 100% true positives, 100% false positives puts, puts me in the median line, 50% result. Similarly, if I just said, no, no, that's not a bottle. Well, actually, I'm going to score pretty well on not getting any false positives because I'm not going to give any positives at all. And there aren't very many bottles. So actually, I'll mostly be right. Uh, you know, so there you go. So. Hang on, that sounds like a really good strategy. Why am I not just doing that? Well, that, that's, how, that's where this curve comes, in, comes into play because it talks about the ratio of the true positives to the false positives. Um, what, uh, I'm not 100% clear why they don't just use the ratio, but they use the area under the curve. I assume for similar reasons about like squaring things and trade-offs and, and, and wanting to penalize, penalize bad results, and it's probably more robust to things with different uh, different ranges and things along those lines and it's very well accepted or it's fairly well accepted because it is so complicated to explain even people who work in these areas like their, their, their detailed understanding of this will drift over time so relatively simple scores like the percentage that you got right are often more useful as an explanation tool like even for people who work in the field it's pretty easy to understand that you are 98% correct and it might be pretty hard to understand how to properly interpret an area under a curve like this. Um, but it's commonly used and it will allow you to talk about some things that, that a simple percent correct won't. Like, for example, if I just always say it's not a bottle and there's you know, 10 things, I'm going to get 80% and that sounds really good. If I use this while I haven't done the, the maths, because again, terrible at maths, you will, you will get a more realistic reflection of, of your actual performance because you will get, you will get a horrible you know, false positive rate or true positive rate if your strategy is to always just pick one or the other. So it forces you to do the best job you can uh, of identifying the relationship. So I'm going to talk about something else with machine learning, which is visually identifying your data. So, so those numbers are, are like, you know, you've done, you've done your test, you've, you've evaluated your performance, and you just get kind of a number. Numbers aren't really nice to work with. They don't really help you understand what's going on. There are a lot of visual ways to understand your performance. There's a, a scatter plot, uh, there's heat maps, there's line charts. So I'm literally just going to pick my favorite, which I think is, the, is the, like kind of the underdog. It's like one of the most useful, but you know, the, like the least used, which is a thing called a heat map. I've got a blog post on how to make a heat map, but it's basically you go, it's a way of getting an extra dimension in there and reflecting the inherent dimensionality of your problem. Um, so what we have here is an intensity. The intensity, you could choose to give it a scale or not. Now, they, they say always label your axis, yada, yada, yada. Sometimes you don't want your audience to be able to make that kind of inference. Because, for example, what you might want to focus on is the spatial structure of where the difference occurs. And you might not want someone to think about whether this is a very fine-grained difference or a very significant difference. You might be trying to tell the story of where it is. 
So there are reasons to choose these things. And I've chosen in this slide to exclude the, the scale information about what these intensities means. Um, that said, I probably should have included the fact that generally the paler colors equals more, but that's intuitively true because the graph is telling you it's the number of pedestrians walking in a place at a particular time of day. Um, so this tells you something about the fact that there's variance between days, but that there is a broadly similar picture and that some days inherit, you know, have overall less but a similar kind of median. And the ability to tell hand wavy general stories is super important to not overfitting as a human and to, and, and to being able to understand biases and things like that as a human. You're going to pick up a bias in data a lot better with a visual representation because your brain can do it anyway than you are with just a number. If you have a series of numbers that reflect the same difference versus a picture of those numbers, the picture, the spatial relationships in the picture are going to be far more evident to the, to the uninformed eye than some kind of change to the numbers. Um, so I would, I would strongly recommend um, spending some time visualizing. All right, 2.53. I don't want to not go through these last slides. I apologize if that means we don't have enough time for conversation. Please tweet me positively or negatively if you, you, know, if you want to enter into some, kind, into some discussion afterwards or grab me afterwards. Uh, very approachable. I would love to have conversations about this, but I just can't let go of getting through these last slides. OK, so there are still some problems. The future may not be like the past. The data set you've got may not be like the data that you don't have. There's, there's predictable ways like you know, winter versus summer. There's some, you know, some obvious reason that those things are going to be different. Could be less subtle. Nothing beats a causal explanation. A, hypo a working hypothesis that this thing has a direct causal link to this other thing that you can test on a large amount of data. That is better than in, an in, in a, a non-described way identifying a statistical relationship using a neural network model. You know, like, why do things fall when we drop it because my neural network said so is not a reasonable explanation for how physics works. The same thing is true for trying to understand real world problems. Like, if you want to be treated medically like, you know, oh, why do people get better when their foot get cuts off? Well, it happened this one time to this person who had, a, had an unhealthy foot. Well, I don't have an unhealthy foot. So you won't know where hidden causes lie in a statistical model. You won't know what it's tapping into. You won't know whether your data set happened to be based off the PyCon conference attendeeship and therefore isn't representative of demographics at a whole, as a whole, and the person who's using your model doesn't understand what demographics you had present in the model when you trained it, therefore they use it in an inappropriate circumstance. But if you can draw it back to a physical causal explanation that you can test and, and, and prove, you've done better. Okay. So what is a causal explanation? Well, at its root, causal explanations are still kind of statistical. Like, you know, we, we derive how quickly, th you know, w we have essentially decided what the formula formulas are for physics through trial, error, and repetition of experiments and trained, out, trained it again and again and again and decided that the remaining errors are due to things like instrumentation errors rather than due to the fundamental law and rule, for example. But it is essentially still a statistical process. There may well be some stochastic element to how the world actually works that we haven't represented in our rules. Um, I'm going to skip over this one and get into some of the directions in data science. OK, this is just cool. This is something called deep dreaming. This is the intermediate visualization of a neural network. So as I understand it, those things I was talking about, about the stuff in the middle that's doing some processing, basically tells you things about what the neural network is looking for according to the activation of its functions over some kind of example at some kind of intermediate layer. Now, I haven't really gone and checked whether this is like a part train network or something like this. As I understand it, this is, if you give, it a, if you give a neural network any input data, it will have some level of activation function in its intermediate layer prior to it deciding whether it is or is not. Uh, you know, giving you your final output. And if you render, the, if, you're, if you're doing an image processing problem and you render those intermediate sol, uh, stages, you get these pretty trippy images. And there's another one there. So some people use it to say, well, this means that the neural network is using these kinds of line ridge features in order to do its logic and that there's something semantic going on here. It is very hard to avoid semantic 
hypotheses about what's happening inside a neural network, again with the making stuff up. No one, I, I really don't believe, I could be wrong, I, you know, researchers can, can ha rail on me afterwards about how wrong I am. My understanding is that you can't really necessarily trust these, these uh, exp explanatory examples. And the reason is adversarial examples. So the reason that you can't necessarily uh, claim that you've understood is adversarial examples. So these are pairs of images. Now, I certainly can't visually distinguish e any of these pairs of images. But you know what? A neural network can't correctly recognize the ones on the right. So it's trained on the example on the left, and it doesn't know what the one on the right is. So that's super interesting. So what that means is that for that particular network configuration, the way it happened to be trained at that point on time with that set of input data, that network could identify that one and not that one. And that was arrived at by t taking the image, modifying the pixel values to a fine degree on a per pixel basis to try and minimize the correct activation functions of the network after training. So try to identify a very visually close image to a human which is hard for the neural network to identify and the neural network has been made to just fall over and fail on things which you would think it would be just obviously good at. So this puts the lie to that whole thing that we've talked about in terms of like, you know, we've got training data, we've separated out the test, okay, we've also separated out the validation so that even though we're doing that with the learning, there's an entirely separate set for the final result and we've done everything we can to make sure that it generalizes and it doesn't. So that's super interesting. Here's some more adversarial examples, some more pairs of images on the image on the left of things which are, which are mutually unrecognizable. So that's kind of interesting. Now it's 2.59, I've got one minute to go. These are just links that are in my slides. Uh, this guy's, there are lots of machine learning video series on there. This is the one that I think is the best. But I started in the middle and it was awesome. And then I went back to the beginning and it was not awesome. So it may be that he picks up steam. I'm not sure, but that was really, very, very good. Exciting things to try at home. Um, Microsoft have this Azure machine learning platform. So if you don't want to set up your own machine, there's this sort of, you know, wizzy wiggy gooey environment that you can use that's pretty fantastic looking. I haven't actually used it much, but it looks great. And there's this thing called Kaggle, which has an online scripting environment and a whole lot of work data problems that you can try yourself. And there's money prizes. So if you care to try your hand at beating everybody else in the world at machine learning, you are welcome to tilt at it. Python has it all. Yay, Python. Okay, that's it for my, for my talk. So thanks for... Thank you, thank you.